Well, good morning, LaSalle. Welcome to week three of this online worship service, Church in the Time of COVID-19. And maybe this phrase is already shop-worn. I don't know, but LaSalle is a place where you can come as you are and say it with me, everybody, stay where you are. That's right. At least physically speaking, right? Please stay where you are. Stay where you are on behalf of all of us, please, for all of our sakes. Didn't you love what that uh, University of Chicago doc said last week? It's hard to feel like you're saving the world while you lay on your couch watching Netflix. (laughs) I'm imagining you laughing right now. But that's what you're doing by staying in. For as long as the medical people tell us, we will stay in. There have been some public comments um, this last week on America being open for business and open for churches by Easter. Um, I suspect you all know this, but it seems important, you know, to say it publicly. There's no relationship between the raising of Jesus and the raising of the Dow Jones, right? (laughs) You heard Chuck playing it. The blood of Jesus reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. Remember that great Andre Crouch song? The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Amen, man. We proclaim that power every day in every circumstance. Paul preached the resurrection just as powerfully from prison as he did in the public square. Amen? Let's not conflate the two, right? Mm, This week, anxiety, loss, fear. Man, they're tempting masters, aren't they? And throughout the centuries, they have really led humanity to some dark places. God knows that. God knows that. You know, I've said this before, that that phrase, do not fear, do not be afraid, that fear not, you know, um, in all of its forms, it's the most repeated phrase from the mouth of God throughout the entire Bible. From the opening pages of Genesis right on through the book of Revelation. From Adam and Eve hiding in the garden, fearful that God's going to find them out, to the trembling saints standing at the apocalypse in Revelation 2.10, our collective fear and what we do with it occupies a central place in the Judeo-Christian faith. Do not be afraid. But wow, I have a hard time receiving that word. I have a hard time living that word. And I suspect you do too. That text today, made so immediate by Julie and by Lucas, it's a, it's a familiar story about fear, isn't it? Existential fear, which is just a big word to say they thought they were going to die. <laughs> Let's look at it closer. Verse 35 through 38 there. The whole thing, this whole scene begins at Jesus's initiative. It's Jesus who asks this group of disciples to go to the other side of the lake at night. Don't miss that little piece. A storm picks up, the winds grow more intense, the waves get higher, the water starts to fill the boat, the boat threatens to capsize. All the while, Jesus is staying asleep. His head, we are told, resting on a cushion. And yes, that is a very weird and very interesting detail that's been in the text from its earliest inscription. The story is clearly operating on a number of different levels, right? Yes, it's a physical event on a real lake with flesh and blood people who are worried we are not gonna make it out alive. But you don't have to be in psychotherapy to pick up another whole level of meaning, a deep symbolism that's going throughout this story. You know, the crossing of water is often seen as emblematic of our unconscious self. It's that great sea of unknowing, right? The reality of night is that place where our fears become 
oversized, supersized, right? There's a reason we, we call, or we have that phrase, in the dead of the night. <laughs> As several people in our holy half hour, happy half hour have said, it's fear that's gripping them by the throat at 3.30 in the morning. It's fear that's waking them up. You can beat it back during the day. You can turn to something else during the day, but at night in your bed when you wake up with that gripping, gnawing ache in your stomach, it's fear that slaps you on the cheeks wide awake. From the beginning of this story, it, it feels like it's asking to be seen as more than just a sudden squall on a boating expedition. This story is taking us to the deepest worries of our human heart and mind. Is there a better story, a better description for what's happening right now? Maybe you saw this headline. A chaotic storm is upon us. It's an all hands on deck moment and some people are bailing and bailing and bailing water out of a boat that it feels, it still feels like it's sinking. A former LaSalle Young Life leader died of COVID-19. The husband of another LaSalle is battling and recovering while we speak, and at least two others are concerned that they may be infected. And in the midst of this frantic activity and this bailing of water, where is Jesus? Sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. And of course, there's a few ways you can take that picture, right? Mark's readers likely had all sorts of reactions as that story was being recounted to them, right? Again, this begins as oral history first. What the heck? <laughs> what the heck? Is this a picture of a man who just doesn't care? Is this Jesus just bizarrely, really, really tired? Or are we meant to doubt the severity of the storm? Are we to think that maybe the disciples embellish the details a little bit? Because after all, how can one truly be asleep in the boat when the waves are high enough to flip it over? Verse 38b, the disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care? <laughs> don't you care? We're about to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind, said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Do not fear is one of God's most repeated phrases. You know what normally follows that? I am with you. I am with you. Do not be afraid. I go before you. Do not fear. I bring you tidings of great joy. <laughs> when I started ministry at LaSalle 21 years ago, one of the outgoing ministers, Annette Heisinger, gave me this book written by Rabbi Dr. Edwin Friedman. Take this, she said, you'll need it. <laughs> she was right. Dr. Friedman was a psychologist at the National Institute of Health who coined the phrase family systems. He was studying behavioral patterns that exist in community groups of all kinds. Families, you guys gathered there on your couch right now, workplaces, classrooms, congregations. And in all these groupings or systems, one person's behavior affects the behavior of the whole. And in those groups, Friedman identified the importance of what he called the non-anxious presence. The non-anxious presence. The non-anxious presence was often the role of the leader. A person who was centered enough, what Friedman called self-differentiated enough, to not lose themselves when others around them were in frantic fear. 
The non-anxious presence was the still point in a flurry of worry. In an atmosphere where fear floats like charged ions looking for a place to land, the non-anxious leader is that person who stays stable and sane. They don't avoid the conflict. They don't deny the magnitude of the situation. They remain fully alert, fully engaged, fully present, and fully stable. This is Jesus, fully engaged in the crisis, completely present to them, in command of the situation, but without anxiety, fear, or being disquieted in any way. So much so that he then turns to the disciples, no doubt buckets in hand, and asks them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Dang. (laughs) There's so many ways. I want to fill in the answers right there. (laughs) We're afraid. We're afraid because this virus is bigger than anything we've ever seen. We're afraid because so-and-so is working in a clinic without the right mask. I'm afraid because, go ahead, fill in the blanks. I'm afraid because my job is being eliminated, because I don't have enough savings for this, because my mother is asthmatic, because my friend is immunocompromised. I'm afraid I am not up to this. How about that? How about that? I'm afraid I am not up for what this situation demands of me. Have a little faith. Or, as Jesus says the question, do you still have no faith? (laughs) You know, when Jesus says that, I suspect it was said tenderly, lovingly. I suspect he said it with the tone of a person who wants to reach over and take that burden right off your shoulder and put it onto his It's a focused question that gets right to the heart of where we live and how we live. I think he said it in that way that a person who's about to take a bullet for you would say it. Sitting close, leaning over, reminding them, you don't have to live in fear. Have a little faith in me. You know, I pictured this scene the other morning when I was sitting with folks in prayer and almost right away, two other scenes of Jesus doing something so similar came into my mind. The first one was that scene that's in John 14. It's going to be the last real night Jesus shares with his disciples John 14, verse 1. And there's a lot of anxiety already in the room, and they don't even know what's about to go down, right? (laughs) And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Maybe you memorized that too in the old King James Version. Don't let your heart be troubled. The next scene was not too long after that. It's a post-resurrection scene. Now the disciples really don't know what's going on. (laughs) There's an empty tomb. They're more frightened than ever. The world has definitely spun out of control. No one really knows what's happening. They are huddled again in a locked room. And now Jesus appears in their midst. And you know the first thing he says? Peace. My peace I give to you. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? 
You know, and all the stuff that's in our life right now, the uncertainty, the unrest, the political ineptness, the falling markets, the rocketing unemployment, whatever that fear list is for you, the implication of Jesus' tender question is met for us. Have a little faith in me. A man in our morning meditation group shared this beautiful wisdom that came from a friend of his who's a nun. Um, she wakes up every morning. She looks to God. She opens her hands and she says, whatever. <laughs> Don't you love that? Whatever. <laughs> whatever this day brings, I am yours. Whatever this day holds for me, it's being held in your hands. Whatever, Lord. And at the end of the day, she comes back to her bed, she looks up, and with a smile, she says, oh, well, <laughs> oh, well. Because the day, of course, has brought its collection, its assortment of a little bit of joy and a little bit of grief and a little bit of longing and a little bit of disappointments and a, a little bit of I wish I could have done that better and a little bit of I, I wish I had a do over there and a lot of praise and all of it together is just another moment before the Lord. Oh, well, Lord, here is my day. Receive it again. The more we lean into this truth, this truth that I am right here. I am with you, the great I am present fully right here in the boat with us. The more I'm convinced our character becomes a little bit more like Jesus' character. Because it was clear that Jesus, um, not only did he live being a non-anxious presence, he hoped his disciples would live the same way too. The faith that Jesus has it fully in control, he fully believed would start to saturate them. That it would start to sink into them. Faith would start to absorb into all those places where fear had once lived. And like a sponge, they would start to be that same presence in the world. That same still point in the midst of the anxiety of others. Sometimes that insight that Jesus is here with us, that insight that all this is being held in God's hands, sometimes it comes from unlikely places and unlikely people. And I want to close with this beautiful story that's really rooted itself in my own heart, and I throw it out for you guys uh, for that same uh, anticipation. I saw it posted in a Facebook post from a LaSalle here, Deanna White, uh, a young mom with two sons, five-year-old Jordan, three-year-old Lucas. Deanna, some of you would remember, lost her husband a few years ago, and she's working full-time, raising these boys on her own, and that's a lot, as some of you know. We, two of the quarantine, uh, Deanna took the boys out um, for a, a, what ended up being a very long walk, a two-mile walk. Jordan on his bike. You can see him right there on the step. Lucas on his scooter. Deanna with a stroller for when the little one, Lucas, got tired. But about a mile in, Jordan's bike popped a wheel, and Lucas got tired. So Jordan kind of pushed the stroller back while Deanna now a mile away from home, carries the bike and the scooter and kind of pushes the stroller as well to help Jordan. And I'll just read from the post. She says, I was a little exhausted. I was anxious to get home. But then as we walked, Jordan looked up and told me, this is the best time of my life. I asked him why, and he told me because, quote, we get to just hang out and go on bike rides and don't have to go anywhere and play games and just be a family. When I read that, I thought of that um, verse from Isaiah. You may know it. 
the one where Isaiah is seeing a new heaven and just a peaceable kingdom. And he says, a little child will lead them. I wondered if Jesus had that in mind when he said, unless you become like a little child, you won't actually see the kingdom of God. This is the best time of my life. Beautiful, isn't it? But also beautiful is the fact that a single mom of two who worked all day from home, who was worried about getting dinner on the table, could be present enough, centered enough, a non-anxious presence enough to receive Jordan's words for the divine gift that they were. Somewhere in all of this storm is the call of Jesus to you and to me to hear his voice tenderly inviting us to have a little faith and to exercise that faith by being steadfast, steady, a non-anxious presence to the worried people around us. Jesus is right here with us. We can trust him with this little boat and with this storm. Have a little faith. Amen.